Welcome to On the Ballot with Ballotpedia, where we connect people to politics by providing neutral, nonpartisan, and reliable information on our government, how it works, and where it's headed. I'm Frank Festin, and thanks for being with us. The end of last week saw a ton of new polling updates from many of the major polling outlets, trying to capture the constantly evolving pulse of how Americans around the country say they're planning to vote this fall. This year, like every election cycle, extra special attention is paid to those states that get designated as swing states, the closest contests that in most cases wind up deciding the eventual winner. According to most outlets, those states this year are Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin. Today, I'm joined by Laksha Jain, one of the partners of the polling outlet Split Ticket, to break down an aggregate of the polling landscape and to walk us through their most recent ratings of the presidential election, both big picture-wise and for the seven swing states everyone has their eyes on. Laksha, thanks for coming on the show. It's great to meet you. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, so for those who haven't heard of Split Ticket, could you tell us a little bit about your outlet and what you guys do? Yeah, so we are a nonpartisan, data-driven elections website. What we try to do is we try to forecast elections in a data-driven manner and importantly, and I think more importantly than that really, explain elections in an easy to understand way because there's so much data out there and it's really hard to make sense of all of it or even hear of all of it. So what we try to do is we try to boil it down to an easy to understand fashion or format for people. And that is really the MO of our site. Ground everything in data and make it explainable. Yeah, I think that's really important that you guys do that as well. You know, so much of this stuff can feel inaccessible at times. So I definitely appreciated you trying to boil it down. As I mentioned in our introduction, you all just released new ratings for races around the country. Really exciting stuff. We'll spend most of our time in this episode digging into what's happening in the swing states. But big picture wise, according to your evaluation, What's the presidential election at large looking like? Yeah, so in our opinion, Kamala Harris is a mild favorite for the election right now. And that came as a little bit of a surprise to me when we saw what the model yielded after running it. But if you look at it, she's ahead in Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. And not just by half a point, she's actually ahead by over a point. In each of them, she's running a little bit ahead of Joe Biden's 2020 margins in each of those states in polling. And she's also keeping North Carolina close. So because of those four factors and because of the fact that she's ahead in Nevada, she's really a candidate right now that could credibly claim that she has the upper hand in the race. For Donald Trump to make the case that he's favored, you would have to start arguing in favor of polling errors happening for him again. And while people may think of 2016 and 2020 and be like, you know, well, that happened twice. It's also important to remember 2022, where broadly speaking, polls, if anything, overshot Republicans in a lot of key races. So, you know, it's never really great to assume polling bias or whatnot. And if you just take the most unbiased, factual look at data possible, Harris is a tiny favorite today. I think I saw you, Lashia, getting into it with somebody on Twitter about that this morning, just how, you know, in 2016, I think they had Trump at like a 28 or 21 percent chance to win. Was that right? Something like that? Yeah. 29%, I think 538 had. Yeah. And at that time he was such a political unknown. Like nobody really knew what to expect. I think that was kind of a crapshoot. Different story here. I wanted to ask, how do you guys go about revising your races? This time of year, politics really does move a mile a minute. So I'm curious about how you all try to reflect voter sentiment in real time. Yeah. So I think This is why we've moved away from a qualitative way of rating races, where before we looked at all the data we could, and then we ran it through our own mental processes, and we were like, we think this race is favoring the Democrats. We think this is favoring Republicans. The truth is that in a presidential election, there's so much news, it's easy to be swayed by it when the average voter just doesn't hear about it or has it drowned out. Those of us that follow elections on the daily are very, very, very unusual people. We do not reflect the broader state of public opinion, and we overreact to things that most people are frankly never going to hear about. Uh, A good example of this is in North Carolina, where the GOP pulled support for their nominee after a series of controversial statements. To those people that were following him in the media, this came as no surprise. Many of them said, well, what took you so long? But to the average voter, they didn't tune in until very recently. And so in polls, Robinson was keeping it close in March. But then as they started tuning in, Josh Stein pulled away. So where that goes to in this type of election is that 
we know we're not reflective of public opinion and the way we process news is different from how the public processes it. So we create a model that would have done well in past cycles. And then we let the model react to things based on the polling that we get. So the model will only move if Americans show that they're moving in response to an event. That makes sense to me. I appreciate you breaking that down for us. Let's zoom in now to the seven swing states. And again, for our listeners, two things here. We're recording this on Friday, September 20th. So some of this information in a granular sense may change by the time you're listening to it earlier next week. And then of course, we've got Split Ticket's most recent ratings linked in our show notes. You can check those out down below. Lots of interesting stuff to dig in there. So be sure to check that out. Where do these seven swing states stand currently? Basically, the best way to look at it is that they're all very, very close. Polling error happens all the time. It is very unpredictable. Anyone that thinks they know which way polls are going to miss historically has been wrong much more often than not. 2012 was a great example. 2020 was another good example where a lot of Democrats were like, well, they fixed the polls this time. They're going to overestimate Republicans. Nope, didn't happen. 2022 Republicans were so confident that the polls were underestimating them. Didn't happen. So the best thing that I tell people is this is a close election and every core swing state, they are within three points. With that said, it is important to note that a two point lead is not the same as a tie or a one point deficit. Even though they all mean a close race, you ask anyone and basic logic and just common sense will tell you you'd rather be up by two than by down by one. In Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, Kamala Harris is up by roughly two points across the region. In Pennsylvania, she's up by about a point and a half. In Wisconsin, she's up by two. And in Michigan, she's up by closer to three points, but more like two and a half. When you get to the Sun Belt, you see that Kamala Harris is ahead in Nevada and she's tied in North Carolina. She's down in Georgia. She's down in Arizona. And the thing there for her is that she needs to cut that deficit in both the states by ideally clawing back some of the working class minority support that she has lost from Biden in 2020. So whether she can get those voters back to her side, again, these are traditionally Democratic voters. So in theory, she should be able to get them back. And this has happened in the past, but it hasn't happened yet in this cycle. So unless she can get them back, she would be on track to lose those two states right now. Of that bunch, which has moved the most since your last evaluation? So this is interesting because polls bounce around all the time. But what I'll say is that, Frank, I'm going to turn it a little bit and say that where she's made up the most ground has been in the Sun Belt. When she came into the race, she was down by double digits in some polls in Nevada, North Carolina, and in Georgia. Joe Biden had started out in potentially the worst possible position. And that entire region was essentially sliding off the map. Even his campaign conceded the battleground was shrinking. It was down to keeping Nebraska's second district and winning Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Harris has gained so much in the Sun Belt because she's just better with minority voters than Biden 2024 is. Not as good as Biden 2020, it seems, but much better than Biden 24. So she's gained a lot in those areas. And that That has really been the story of why Harris has been such a tough candidate for Donald Trump, because when the map gets that wide, before it was Biden needed to sweep all of the battlegrounds in order to win. Now, Harris has multiple paths to victory. She can win North Carolina, Michigan, Wisconsin, Nevada. She wins even if she doesn't win Pennsylvania. She wins Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania in the second. She wins even if she loses the Sun Belt. That was a path that Biden never had. Got it, Ian. It's pretty crazy to watch how fast the race changed once Biden did drop out. And I think amongst a a bunch of other factors, the polling that the Biden camp was seeing really did seem like it had a lot to do with his decision to drop out. So really interested to see all that ground that she's made up in in what's been a little over two months. Yeah, absolutely. And And I can't think of any race with this type of precedent. It is true that it was a lot of soft undecided squeamish voters, but the fact remains that they did not want to vote for Biden and they very well may just not have shown up. So to see Harris kind of re-energize that entire half while also gaining with swing voters is an extremely unique thing. A lot of historical first happened in this election cycle, and I'm sure that we may have a few more to keep our eye on. But 
Let's take a look at the aggregate of all the major polls that are out there. And as I was looking through this information before we got uh, into our interview this afternoon, it appeared to me that North Carolina and Arizona seem to be the closest of these contests, seems to be the consensus across the board for most of the polling outlets that we have access to. What might be the difference maker in these states? Again, that's North Carolina and Arizona. And are there any notable strategies that you're picking up on from the primary presidential hopefuls? So North Carolina and Arizona both have a couple of similar things between them and a few differences as well. And I think the trajectories of these two states are quite startling. Arizona was, if you remember, extremely Republican in 2008, quite Republican in 2012. In the Trump era, it's really skyrocketed left. Out of any state that doesn't respond well to Donald Trump's MAGA movement, that is probably exhibit A. Ever since Trump won it in 2016, it's been loss after loss after loss for his movement in Arizona from 2020, 2018, 2022 with Kari Lake and Blake Masters. And now that Senate race is sliding off the map for Republicans because Kari Lake is not very popular in Arizona. So Arizona is an interesting state for me because I would have thought personally before building the model, I would have thought that Kamala Harris would be doing better there than North Carolina, which Really, Democrats have a much bigger minority base in North Carolina. It's harder to turn out the Democratic core base voters in the black belt in North Carolina. There's many more challenges there that they face. And yet, despite all of that, and despite all of that logically making complete and coherent sense, North Carolina looks like a better play for her than Arizona right now. And to me, I can't figure out if it's just a polling or if it's real, but I tend to trust what I see. What I see tells me that she has a better shot there right now. And I think a lot of it is partly because the Democrats have continued to put forward a very robust infrastructure in North Carolina, continue to message there. They have a popular governor who boosts their party's esteem. They have a pretty unpopular nominee that they're running against who elevates issues that are broadly unfriendly for the Republicans and in the national spotlight. In Arizona this time, Democrats are struggling with Hispanics. So I think that has served to kind of counter the Democratic gains with white voters. But it's also possible, remember, Frank, that every time someone tries to make demographic extrapolations, they look really stupid after the election. So it's really <laughs> possible that we're going to be looking here on you know November 6th and being like, well, what the heck? That's funny. A lot of gestures in the making over these next couple of weeks. I'm sure that uh, plenty of these predictions are going to be spot on, but I'm sure even more of them will be wildly inaccurate. So it's going to be a lot of fun quote unquote, to see how everything plays out over the next six weeks. What might move the needle between now and then again? It's hard to believe, but there are less than six weeks now between today and the election. So what might move the needle in any or all of these states? If the last few months have taught us anything, it's really that a lot can change in a short amount of time. So what are you looking out for? So I think for me, every day that Kamala Harris maintains a polling lead of about three or four points is a day that Donald Trump loses a chance to redefine the election, which he's really struggled to do ever since Harris got into the race because his team hasn't been able to settle on a coherent strategy that sticks to her and hits her. Harris started out as a very malleable candidate with very uncertain favorables. We didn't really know what to make of her. And the public has responded well to her. To me, what that means is what I'm looking for is does her favorability rating continue to climb? And if it continues to climb and it continues to exceed Donald Trump's by double digits, what's going to happen is you're probably going to see a lot of people break in favor of Harris if they're still undecided as the election nears. And that probably doesn't play well to Trump. On the other hand, if Trump can turn it against Harris through either an economic crash or an immigration crisis message and hit her hard again and tie her back to an unpopular Joe Biden, you'll see that in her plummeting favorability rate. And that relative favorable gap is, I tell people, the single most important thing to look at when you're evaluating an election because it tells you how voters see those candidates almost directly. It's not as good as horse race, but if you're looking for something beyond horse race polling, that would be the biggest thing for me. Laksha Jane of Split Ticket, thank you so much for your time today. I learned a lot and we're going to be watching your forecasts and modeling really closely between now and Election Day. Thanks, Frank. It was a pleasure. And our listeners, please stay tuned. We'll be right back with election staff writer Glory Martinez with more on how these swing states voted in these last several elections and 
how the states designated as swing states have changed over time. Pretty interesting stuff. Stay tuned. Hi, Allison here from Ballotpedia's communications team. And I've got something new and exciting that I want to tell you about today. Whether you are a seasoned voter like me, I've been voting for more than 40 years, <laughs> or if you're voting for the first time this November, our new election voter toolkit is here to help with everything you need to get prepared for voting. We want you to feel great about casting your ballot. And what we mean by great is that you're able to vote with confidence. Within our toolkit, you'll find personalized voting information, our sample ballot, election calendars, state-specific information sheets, ballot measure information, and ballot measures can be really quite complicated. And so we also provide content about ballot measures to help you understand a little bit more about what they mean in layperson's terms, which is super helpful, and our help desk to help answer any questions you may have about the voting process. So we've got it all, and I think you're going to love it. Your vote matters, and we're here for it, and we've got you covered. Glory, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, it's your first time on the show as well, so we're really excited to get you in the mix. It's always good to get new Ballotpedia folks on the podcast. Yeah, definitely. I'm excited to be here. So for as much as we talk about which states or swing states every election cycle, I don't typically see a ton out there explaining how we all come to these conclusions. So what makes a state actually a swing state? Yeah, so swing states are states that have split support for Democratic and Republican candidates in recent presidential election cycles. They've also been called battleground states or purple states. And they're really important to a candidate's campaign strategy because the majority of states in the U.S. aren't competitive. They'll vote for the same presidential party election after election. But swing states are different. They're much more of a toss-up. Ballotpedia identifies swing states by using the average of race ratings from outlets like Cook's Political Report, Inside Elections, and Sabato's Crystal Ball. This year, we've identified seven, and these states are going to be key to determining an election winner. Nice. And listeners of the show that have been listening for a while will know that we've had pollsters from all three of those organizations, and you just heard a pollster from Split Ticket on earlier in the show. Polling, as you just mentioned, seems to be at the heart of how we identify swing states every year. But again, not really the most commonly understood and clear practice. I feel like there's a lot of question marks every year, especially increasingly so over the last couple of years about how the methodology works, who's being surveyed and polled, all those things. We just heard a bunch, again, of polling information from Lakshia from Split Ticket a few moments ago. But Glory, how does polling actually work? Like, what does the process look like, generally speaking? I know there's a lot of different variations, but in general terms. Mm -hmm. Political polls give insight into popular opinion by surveying a representative sample of people from a larger population. And what this is useful for is helping inform policy decisions and helping candidates decide how to focus their campaign strategies. There's so many different ways of doing this, and we have a lot more info on Ballotpedia's site, and we'll drop a link to it in the show notes. How have the swing states shifted over time? A lot of the folks we talked to on the show regarding polling have noted a distinct shift in our national politics and the electoral college math following President Barack Obama's tenure from 2008 to 2016. As listeners doubtlessly know, they need a pollster to tell them that that was a time of a lot of changes in our country. So how have our swing states changed in the last 16 to 20 years? Yeah, um, it's been really interesting to see how swing states have shifted over the past few election cycles. For example, this year, Georgia and Arizona are considered some of the tightest races, and they used to be pretty solid Republican strongholds. On the flip side, you have states like Ohio and Florida, which were swing states in 2008, but are now considered more Republican. The same is true for Colorado, which is now leaning Democratic. Then there are states like Nevada, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania, which have kind of been flip-flopping between red and blue over the last few election cycles. Again, there's a lot of different reasons for this. States change their political preferences mainly because of shifts in population demographics. For example, Hispanic communities from countries like Cuba and Venezuela are growing in places like Florida, and these communities tend to vote Republican. On the other hand, you have an uh, influx of young, college-educated voters moving to Georgia, and they bring their Democratic-leaning politics along with them. So new residents in a state can really shift the political scene. Thinking of the current swing states in this year's election, 
How did they vote in the 2020 election? Can you give us a little bit of a rundown? Yeah. So all of the swing states we've identified this year, um, except for North Carolina, were won by Biden in 2020. North Carolina actually hasn't voted for a Democrat since Obama in 2008. A lot of these states also voted for Trump in 2016, but not again in 2020. And that's an interesting thing to note. That includes Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, and Georgia. Arizona and Georgia both voted Republican for the last three election cycles. And Biden's victory there was pretty close. He defeated Trump by less than 1% of the popular vote. Then we have Florida, which voted for Obama in 2008 and 2012. He won there by a pretty slim margin, and Trump kind of carried the state after 2016. Those seven swing states that I think most people universally agree on are Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, North Carolina, Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin, just to, just to put a bow on that for us before we move on. Glory, on our main 2024 presidential pages, we've got a lot of interesting and thorough data about you know, how the prediction markets and forecasting are thinking about the election, big picture wise, all sorts of other things. In terms of the national picture, Glory, what's sticking out to you there? Yeah. So on site, we have information on prediction markets, which is just a place where people can buy and sell shares based on what they think will happen in the future. It's like betting on different outcomes. In this case, betting on whether a specific candidate will win in the presidential elections. And the price of these shares reflect what people believe about the chances of those events happening. So if a lot of people think that something is likely, the price for that outcome goes up, reflecting that confidence. Right now, the prediction market has 57 cents on Harris winning the presidential election and 46 cents on a Trump win. One interesting note is that confidence in Trump winning the presidency peaked in July 2024 with a value of 69 cents. But by the beginning of August, after Harris announced her candidacy, she has surpassed Trump as the popular choice to win, with 53 cents to Trump's 49. The gap between those two candidates peaked shortly after, at around 59 cents for Harris and 44 for Trump, before eventually leveling out to the smaller difference that we see today. And it'll be interesting to see if that gap continues to close as we get closer to the election in November. If you visit our page, you can find lots more valuable information like historical performance of third party candidates, race ratings from outlets like Cook's Political Report, Sabato's Crystal Ball and Inside Elections and details on early voting. And by the time you're hearing this, early voting has started in Minnesota, South Dakota, Virginia and Vermont. Nice. These numbers are changing all the time. The polling information is always evolving. So lots to watch here. Be sure to keep an eye on all of those polling outlets and then our site as well, of course. Gloria Martinez from our elections team, thank you so much for coming on the show. Of course, thank you for having me. Yeah, and our listeners, you can learn more about our presidential election coverage at the links in our show notes. We've got a lot of information packed in there for you today, so make sure you go check that out. We'll be back later this week with another episode. Make sure you subscribe to On the Ballot wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Frank Vesta, and thanks for listening. We'll see you later this week.